following episode contains language and descriptions of violence and self-harm. It may not be appropriate for all listeners, but it was my life. Discretion is advised. What up, what up, what up? Welcome back to another episode of Roll Call with Chappie. I don't get tired of saying the same stuff, but this dude is a special treat for you guys today. I'm going to let him introduce himself to you. So JC, Wrong to Strong, let them uh, let them know how to get a hold of you and stuff and who you are. Hey, what's up, guys? Well, uh, man, I'm I'm actually blessed to be here today. Uh, thank you. When you called me, I was like, oh man, that's that's my dog right there. But uh, you guys can find me on Instagram, uh, any kind of social media platform. Just type in Wrong to Strong, and you'll you'll see my ugly face on there. <laughs> there we go. So um, you want to talk about some troubles growing up, man? This dude's story is. Um, I mean, I feel like I say this all the time, but it's absolutely insane, and uh, I feel like it's going to top all the others that I've had on here. So. Let's get into how you grew up, because this dude was involved with the cartel and all kind of stuff, like way worse than U.S. prison stuff. So what was it like growing up for you? And then I want to know, like, what age you started getting in trouble and stuff down there in Mexico? Uh, I mean, uh, when my parents came over at 14 from Mexico, my, my mom and dad were 14 years old. So when they uh, got to Chicago, my dad started getting involved with the, with the gangs and the drugs, and, and he ended up, you know, abandoning my mom. So that forced my mom to move in with uh, an uncle of ours uh, that ended up uh, molesting me and, and uh, torturing me and, and just doing a lot of bad stuff to me from the age of four to about nine. Wow. So by the time I was nine, my, my heart was like stone already. I mean, I was, I was 10 years old trying to like smoke people on the street in Chicago. I mean, every gang member loves a broken child, you know? Absolutely. And That's what they prey on. And uh, I was just, I, I mean, I'm not going to lie, I, I was, I didn't have no heart. I was just out there trying to try to hurt people. I wanted blood, I wanted revenge, and, and uh, that's the way that I was trying to make it even for, for everything sure. that was done for me. Um, I got into gangs pretty fast. <laughs> I mean, I hung around with every kind of gang in Chicago. Uh, that's the perfect prototype right there for a kid to get into gangs, too. Yeah, yeah I mean, they, they th thrive on that, you know, that's how the big, the big chiefs uh, get their stuff done, you know, yeah. and and that's what I did, you know, and, and I moved me up the ladder pretty fast. That by the age of sixteen, I had got uh, you know accepted into cartel school. <laughs> Congrats! <laughs> <laughs> you know they flew me out to Mexico, and uh, I got my first job, and I got you know I got trained, I got military training, I got the basic stuff that I need to do to. Uh, What's a job consist of? Like first job, can you even tell tell me or? I mean, the first job was pretty much just taking care of the fields. You know, okay. if, if if the military came in, we had to pretty much take care of business. You know, we knew how to use assault rifles and walkie talkies and and all that stuff. So we would have just shootouts. I mean, what kid didn't like a shootout? <laughs> wow. yeah. So we did that with squirt guns and shit, not assault rifles. <laughs> so that's how it started. And, and then um, I got made like a manager. I got, I got moved up and I was taking care of the cars that were coming in and, and leaving to Chicago. So it would be, you know, a, a crew of cars that would come in six or seven, uh, they would get loaded and they would get sent to Chicago. And I just made sure everything made it from point A to point B, and I was 16 years old making about 30 grand a, a week. That's so, your king shit, huh? I thought I was untouchable. You yep. know, I was going to nightclubs and, and wearing chinchilla coats and, and just the gold chains and everything. I thought that I had found, like, life, and uh, I, I thought I was, I thought I always wanted to be a gangster. I, that's what I used to think back Same, then. Yeah. You know, I thought I always wanted to be a gangster. And, uh, it, it just got worse. I, I started getting more ugly, more, di more, I guess you could say, disgusting were the way that I was living. I was living in complete sin, uh, sleeping around, uh, just doing really bad stuff, trying to take people's lives and s flooding the streets with drugs. Yeah. You know, um, I ended up getting caught when I was 17 in Mexico, uh, and I experienced Mexican jail. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, how's that? And, and uh, that's real jail. Yeah. You know, uh, every jail here in the United States, no matter how dangerous it is, it's a five-star hotel compared to Mexican prison. Yeah. And I, I don't say that to brag or nothing. I just say it because it was really tough being in, in a Mexican prison, being an American. Yeah. Well, tell them how it is, too, because this is going to be in all the all the people are listening that are in prisons across the country, too, and it might help a lot of them have a little gratitude with the cell <laughs> they're in right now. So let, I'm, I'm being serious. Like, tell them how bad that shit was. You it? know, over there, man, if you don't have money, you, you're not going to live 
in a nice cell. If you don't have money, you're not going to have clothes. You're not going to eat. There's a lot of things that American prisons provide for prisoners that Mexican prisons don't provide. Like, if you don't have money, you literally don't eat or drink, right? Nothing. Unless there's, like, leftover from Left one of the bosses or something. Leftover, somebody looks you up, helps you out. Yeah. I mean, the prison has a basic, basic that they give, but once it's done, it's done. Like, if you didn't make it in the line, yeah. you didn't make it. Yeah. So, you know, when I got there, uh, I, I thought it was big stuff when I got there still because I had connections there. Um, I got stabbed as soon as I was there for my for my. Uh, Jordans. Uh, I think I was there for like five minutes. Shut up. Yeah. And, and were you be honest? Were you scared going there for your first time? Because I'm a tough dude, bro. I was still scared going to. Well, you yeah. Know, your I first mean, time. I mean, you you learn in this life. You learn to block out, like not yeah. not show that you're scared yeah. because you can't. You they'll eat you alive. Or I would so, just harness that to like eat, making me meaner. Yeah, and stuff, yeah. You know? I know. It, but you're literally pooping in your pants. But you're like, you got this face that it's trying to scare everybody. Mm -hmm. And that's what I remember. It was this big black gate and they just opened it. They threw me inside. And I had, you know, I was dressed all in a Jordan suit. I had two big bags full of American clothes. And, and oh, yes. uh, I'm just standing around oh, looking straight, side to side. Right there for them. I know, dudes. side to side. And then even, and I was, I told the guard, I was like, hey, so where's my cell? Where, where do I go live or what? <laughs> and he's like, buscale. And that means just go Get find Get out of here, yeah. You know I mean? And I'm like, man, I'm really in Mexico. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, I start walking and a little crew of guys. And this is the first time that. I see gang members with like tattoos on their face. Yeah. Back there, it wasn't common like it is now. For sure. You know, uh, uh, back then, uh, everybody would hide their gang tattoos. Maybe the California guys were a little bit more tatted up, but you wouldn't really see guys with horns on their faces and stuff like that. And I get a bunch of guys come up to me with tattoos on their faces, all tatted up, skinny, just looking bad. Like they, they needed to eat, like they needed cheeseburger or something. <laughs> so that makes them even more dangerous. And they, uh, they tell me to give up the shoes. So I was like, go ahead, homie, try and take them. Yeah. Well, they took them. <laughs> <laughs> they hit me in the back with a, a ice pick. And slow, slowly, my lungs started filling up with blood. Ooh. So every time I was breathing, it was causing pain in my stomach. So it got to the point where I just fell to the ground and just lost conscience. And uh, I, I woke up and I was... Uh, in the hospital in the Mexican prison and uh, the people that I'm that I'm going to go live with are there there are other guys that have been caught before but they're from the same same cartel I'm from okay and uh, they're like well you're gonna have to take care of business after you get out of here you're not gonna make us look bad and I'm like man I was like, I don't even know what's going on. Literally, still. yeah. You're like, what the like, heck do you mean take care of business? Yeah. I just I just got there. I'm thinking that maybe my people are gonna get me out because I'm important and and I'm thinking all this stuff, I'm just going crazy. And no, I you know, I ended up staying there for four years, man. But no it way. was it was it was it was bad. I mean, it it was bad. When I say it was bad, you know, because when I got there, I I was uh a, a kingpin you know i lived by myself i had carpet in my room i had a big screen tv i walked around in my nike suits big gold chains uh, uh i was always eating at restaurants drinking every weekend doing you know drugs whatever and wanted, women yeah. whatever yeah. i wanted you know whatever i wanted and uh i ended up getting hooked on crack and it, it was funny because i guess over there all the kingpins that have money that are doing time they, they look at like cheaper drugs, like for poor people, like weed, pills, stuff like that. Mm. They look at crack, like that's like the, the drug to do sure. for, the, wow. for the rich people. And yeah, because you have to have a lot, a lot of money, money yeah. to fulfill that, that drug. And I got addicted and, and it was so bad. I, I sold everything in my, in my room. Um, I, I became the one thing that I like disliked so much on the street. I, I became a crackhead. Yeah. And everybody would make fun of me in there because all the, all the drug lords, you know, uh, that I knew in there, a lot of them were jealous of me because I was American and I was working for the main dude there. And he absolutely loved me. Mm -hmm. um, he always said the Americans were hustlers. So I was always out there selling and selling for him. And uh, uh, they just didn't like me. They didn't like me. Um, and they always had it out for me. So when I lost everything, they were always trying to humiliate me, always trying to put me down. and, and for sure. It was such a awakening for me that I was like, wow, you know, uh, I'm going to die here. And uh, one day out of nowhere, uh, 
the American consul got there and they're like, oh, Manza. And I was, I was out of it because it got to the point where I got so poor that I was just sniffing on paint thinner. No like, way. I couldn't, I couldn't afford nothing else. Yeah. And my addiction was still there. Yep. So I was just sniffing a tinder and it was about a buck, a dollar a day. That's, that's what I could do. And, and, uh, and I was like, I'm here. And they're like, you're going home. And I was like, get out of here. I didn't even believe them, you know? Just out of the blue like yeah, that? Yeah, out of the blue. Wow. I was part of the last, uh, they had an exchange program with the United States and Mexico where they were exchange inmates. And that year it finished. So I was one of the last ones to get on that plane. Wow. And get, get brought over. Damn, if not, I wonder how long you would end up being in there. You probably would have died in there, bro. Well, they had gave me, they had gave me a 15-year sentence. And over there, there is no good time. Over there, there's no 80 or 50. There's yeah. nothing like so you do there was. There was dudes there like that had. They did their whole 10 years, and yeah. they still weren't letting them go. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so imagine that. I was like, that's it for me. I'm done, you know. And uh, American consul came and got me, brought me over. I'm sitting on the plane because it's a really big, like it's a big plane with a lot of Americans on there. And I'm looking back and I see all the Americans and I see how bad everybody looks. Because remember, as, as everything that happened to me as a kid, like I've been in counseling, I've been seeing psychiatrists. So I get an idea of somebody has got some mental issues. You for know sure, what I mean? For so sure. I look back on the plane and I see all these Americans, man, just looking bad. And, and I know it was from seeing stuff that they shouldn't have seen. There's a lot of stuff there humans for your for your Bro, mental, i still have that stuff from prison i can't even yes. watch ufc fights from just seeing yes. bloody ass it, stuff you know and, and that's crazy because a lot of people don't realize that that when you see a prison get stabbed like 30 times and there's blood squirting everywhere like it changes you it, it changes everything about you it's you know i always think do i still hear in my head like this because like not only do you when you see someone get stabbed like the other stuff that people don't realize like it sounds like someone's getting slapped well, and yeah. you know someone's like, cause they're bearing a piece in them. It's yeah. like, bro, I still hear like, it sounds like you're slapped. They're it's getting that popping every, noise. Yeah, they're that popping. Bro, noise. I still hear that in my head sometimes, bro. Yeah, like from bro. stabbings in prison. And, 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 and you know, uh, I, I didn't, they didn't call it PTSD back then because when we got to El Paso Federal Prison, um, it's a, a medium high security prison that takes, you know, the, the exchange uh, inmates. Uh, when we got there, they brought us into a room and they started showing us all these movies from Vietnam vets, how bad they were coming back from the war, they were becoming drug addicts, uh, mental problems, all these things, but they didn't call it PTSD back then. You know, they were just explaining that we were gonna have issues now, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I've had issues since I've been four yeah. years old. <laughs> I was like, this is gonna but be like, I've never park. not had issues. <laughs> so, uh, you know, um, I, I did my time there, I got released. Uh, I was free for maybe, I was there for about a year. And then all my good, uh, I, my good time came in for pain and suffering. Okay. Every day that I did in Mexico counted as two. Okay. So like I did a bunch of time really quick. <laughs> so what time did you finally get out? How old were you? Uh, I want to say I was in my early 20s. I want to okay. say 24, 25. I went in at 17. Damn. Um, so I get out, right? And I'm getting dressed and I'm like, yeah, man, I'm going home. I'm going to go hit the streets. And as soon as I walk out, I see two guys with cowboy hats. This is the first time I ever see, like, Texas Rangers. Yeah. <laughs> so I walk out, and uh, there's two of them waiting for me, and they're like, Mr. Almanza? And I was like, yeah. He's like, you're under arrest. I was Shut like, up. I was like, man, five minutes? I mean, why didn't even warn me inside, you yeah. know, that I was going to get, you know, picked up? But now they arrested me. They took me to the downtown um, uh, county prison from El Paso, and uh, they were trying to extradite me to Chicago because I had a, a open uh, shooting case uh, that I had caught years back. Um, gotcha. I have a bunch of uh, gun cases in Chicago, man, that they haunt me to this day still. Yeah. And uh, I got arrested. So I sat there in the county jail. Finally, they released me on uh, me turning myself in. And it's, I went straight to Chicago, got on the bus, um, and I turned myself in. You know, at first I was going to run. I'm not going to lie. I, I was going to run for it. Yeah. And just, but at the time I had a little daughter, my, my first daughter, and I was like, ah, oh, man, I'm just, my whole life I wanted to change, like I was telling you outside, man, but I just didn't know how. Yeah. So sure. I was trying to do what's right, even in my, my worst times. 
So I turn myself in, and, and the judge gives me props for turning myself in. She's like, oh, wow, you just got here, and you turned yourself in. That's good. I was like, yes, ma'am. And she's like, you know what? She's Because they were going to give me seven years for that shooting case. So it would have been back-to-back time. In your 30s, yeah. yeah. And she's like, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on the gang program, and if you complete it in six months, you get released. There you go. So I, I went to the gang pro, pro, program. Um, what was that like? Military, uh, get up, stand by your bed. A bed oh, so it's like the ones that try to bait you and all your yeah, shit to get you it, kicked out? It's just, it, it was nothing but gang members. Yeah. It was impossible to finish the program. Me and my buddy got kicked out the first week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We got kicked out, so we got sent to the penitentiary, and we did our time, got out, and I got home, and... Uh, I was a young kid that made a lot of big connections in federal prison because I tell people that back when I went into federal prison, it was the mid-90s, there were no gang members in the federal prison. These were all mafia dudes, yeah. dudes from Cali, uh, straight cartel people, straight mm-hmm. people with money. You've seen dudes in there walking around with bathrobes and gold mugs and, and stuff like that. You know, were you ever 10, in there with 000? Seth Ferranti? No. Okay. Uh, uh, and I'm really bad with names anyway. <laughs> but... Uh, that's how it was in there, and I made a lot of connections while I was in there. I was a young kid that a lot of dudes took under their wing, you know, and I got home, and, and I got back to selling dope again, and I pretty much... Did you make any plans to try and be good on the streets, or were you just like, you, that's all you knew, so you were just going back to what you knew? I, I tried. I mean, when, when, I got, when I got home, the people that I was working for, you know, gave me, I think, about 20 grand and gave me a brand new truck for, you know, keeping my, my mouth closed and, and still yeah, my yeah. time. And I used some of that money to get, I went to a CDL school to go get a, a truck driver's license mm-hmm. and all that stuff. And, um, and I, I wanted to change, but as soon as I would apply for jobs or anything, they would tell me no. And it was no here, no that. So finally I was like, you know what, I'm just going to go back to what I know how to do. Yeah. And since I had met people in there, it wasn't, it wasn't just one kilo now. It was 10, 20, 50, 40. It was more. So... I, it got to my head again. That's what, it, that's what happens when, when people get locked up. They don't realize you either it's about a twenty percent chance you're going to better yourself, or the other eighty percent is you just make more connections. Yeah. You just become into a bigger yeah. gang banger and more and come more back with more time. Hundred percent, yeah. And, and that's what happened. I mean, I I started getting back in the game. I uh, me and my wife, uh, I, I married somebody to get into a family, um, and we ended up having a, a restaurant, Mexican restaurant, on the South Side of Chicago. Uh, this is where I started connecting with the twins, the Flores twins, the ones that put El Chapo away. Yeah. And it, it just, life got really, really big, really animated. Uh, big house. Like How old are you at this time, 30 or so? I'm um, about 25, 26 okay. in my late 20s, hitting late, late 20s. Um, making that money, uh, Cato uh, starts a record label and... I'm friends with him now, and, and DMX is in the scene now, and we're doing rap videos now, and it's, it, it, it morphed into something really big. For sure, sounds like it. And it, 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 it made my ego get even bigger, you know, but at the same time, I was dealing with uh, people trying to kill me every day, getting robbed. I don't know how many times I've been tied up. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Do we even have enough time to tell my story? <laughs> <laughs> right? Seriously. <laughs> but it, it just, it, it got really, really bad to the point where finally I was like, that's it. Like, I'm, I'm moving to Arizona. Uh, my grandparents were out here. DMX was out here. So I, I thought that by moving down here, my life would change. Mm-hmm. I would become a good dude. <laughs> of course, right? <laughs> so Just move away from the problems. Just, they're not going to follow yeah, me. They're not going to follow me. And little did I know, right here I, for I found the same problems over here, but just different. You and know? some new ones, because you already know the bad shit you know, and now all you're looking for yeah. is the same shit here. <laughs> so I'm out here now. Now I get I get into a motorcycle gang. <laughs> Add that to the belt the gangs are involved with, right? So, you know, now, now I'm riding motorcycles out here. I'm hanging out with the Hells Angels. I'm doing this and that. I'm going to prison for DUIs, uh, running from the cops on my motorcycle. Um, uh, there's a strip club on every corner over here in Arizona. There's yeah. a liquor store on every corner. So very, very different life compared to Chicago, you know what I mean? Different, different sin, I call it. Okay. And... Uh, I, I got really addicted to that life. Uh, I would, I, as soon as the strip clubs would open at 10 in the morning, I was there. I was there till 2, 2 a.m. 
and I would be selling drugs all day. I would be dating strippers all that's that's what yeah. I did. That was my life. And uh I ended up catching my my big federal case out here and that was it. Like I, I thought, man, this is it. I'm done. You know, um What was this case for? Six keys of coke. Damn. And uh with my background, my Damn. first my first plea was uh it was pretty big, man. Something? 32 years. Yeah. Um, Damn, that's crazy you're even out, bro. Yeah, bro. You know, God God is God is good, but we'll get to that part. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Uh, so, man, being in the system for so many years, I kind of know what they want. They either want you to tell on somebody or they want some money or they want a lot of drugs that you might have put away. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So I ended up, you know... Just uh, you have a stash I, pot? Yeah, I gave them everything I had. Everything I had, it hurt because it was it was cash, and you know it hurt me. I was like, man, if they give me thirty two, I could do twenty seven, and get out and still have money, a bunch of money. So I'll be in my sixties, but I'll be good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I really thought about it, and I was like, nah, you know, it's, it's time. Know, yeah. It's time for me to try and change. And uh, I gave it all up, and. and the judge was cool, you know, she, my lawyer came in, I had a really good lawyer, and, and he was like, dude, you're going to have to tell, this is the first time that I actually tell my story about what happened to me as a kid, and how I grew up, okay. and why I was as damaged as I was. A lot of people don't know how damaged I really was, so like, uh, for sure. Uh, I said the whole spill, you know, I told everything to the judge, and the judge was like, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a chance. I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna give you a chance to still try and make it one more time. Wow. Even though your rap sheet's like as long as rap sheet's taller than you. You're only five <laughs> five, bro. <laughs> so she gave me the ten years. Uh, uh, gave me the drug program. The RDAP program back then was giving you four years off your sentence. Okay. So you were looking at six and some change. So uh, yeah, she sent me off, and, and I, I got to uh, a really Good yard, I want to say, but it was flooded with Latin kings, and I didn't, I didn't want to gangbang no more. You know, um, I, I just on the bus I was praying. I Did was you roll like, with Latin kings on? Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, I was I was praying on the bus, and I was like, please, please, God, let there no be no Latin kings there, please, please. As soon as I get there, the gang guy gets me, and he's like. Oh, there's like 63 of your guys here. And I was like, oh, man. You're like, I'm Dude. trying to lay down, bro, right? <laughs> so, you know, the more guys you have there, the more political it's going to be. 100%. And, and the more time consuming and the more dirt you're going to be doing. And, yep. and I was just like, man, I'm getting old. What am I doing here? God, that life sucks, bro. I'm just yeah. having flashbacks right now thinking of that shit. And uh, I was like, well, here I go again. You know what I mean? And uh, I went in there. And, and things worked out for me while I was there. You know, uh, a lot of the kings ended up getting taken off the yard and stuff like that. So I ended up going to education and, and getting my life together. And this is, a, this is the time I always say that God like, started pulling on my heart because I went into the art debt program and my, my last year that I was there before I graduated, uh, I had to live with a Christian. And this is a this dude is is to this day I still talk to him, but this dude is well well connected from Mexico. Everything had a, done a lot of time, so he was like a hardcore Christian, like yeah. no messing around. Like either you love Jesus, or I'm gonna stab you, <laughs> kind, of, kind, of, <laughs> kind of thing. But yeah. you know, he was so humble. Where like he always wanted to clean the cell. He would tell me just leave. He would bust. He would buff the floor. He would always make a meal with me on, on Fridays and we would sit down like a family. And Those are my kind of sellies yeah. I like, bro. Yeah, yeah. Bro, like he just, he taught me so much because I was so selfish. It was all about, that's the only way I knew how to survive. For sure. Just being selfish, taking care of me. Yeah. And he taught me so much in and, and that year. And, um, you know, I ended up getting out and, and coming home in 2013. And I was, I had this mindset that I was going to become the, the biggest, baddest trainer, you know, Phoenix had ever seen. I was going to use all my connections to to make it happen and and, and do all these things. And, you know, I, I, I came home and I started from scratch because I didn't have nothing. Um, I went to go work at LA Fitness, but into a year, I became their lead trainer. Then after that year, I opened up my own gym. 
and things were popping. <clears throat> yeah. They're then that's popping. a good thing too for any, any people that are li uh, listening to this too that are locked up and want to get out. Like literally, gyms will hire you if you don't want to train yeah. and do that stuff. It's fitness is a great thing, bro. Yeah. So it's not, you don't have to just just do construction. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It, that's, that was one of the things that when I was going to the second chance program here in Arizona, I was trying to teach the guys how to become personal trainers because it's the one job that you set your own hours, yeah. your own rate. You work when you want to, and you can use it as a side hustle. And you too. can make more money every month if you yep, want. Yeah. Yep. So like, you know, when I opened up my gym, it, it got it got my head a little bit big, and I started uh, playing cat and mouse games with with my PO, and uh, I would wait for him to drop me, and then boom, as soon as he would drop me, I would be at Twin Peaks, getting you know, getting high, getting drunk. Yeah. And uh, he ended up getting just tired of my stuff, and he's like, he ended up sending me back. I was about to say that's usually a recipe for disaster, right there. Yeah, and. Um, he sent me back, and this is when he sent me to one of the most dangerous prisons here in America, man. He sent me to uh, Victorville USP I've heard of that, behind man. the wall. And these yeah, are all lifers. Is. Yeah, all lifers, bro. Yeah. I mean, I was there for five minutes, and some dude had already got stabbed to death over a piece of chicken. And I was sitting on the table, and I see- That's seen, the one place that got serial killers and all that yeah, shit. Yeah, everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, you- I, I, I was sitting there eating the piece of chicken, and you could see the, the handprints of the blood of the guy trying to run up the wall because they were stabbing him so many times. And I just put my head down, and I was like, like what am I doing here again? Yeah. And, and honestly— you, Are you religious, or do you have faith at this time? Do you pray or not? No, or I mean, I, I prayed back then. I was like a shotgun prayer. It was uh, every time I got in trouble, yeah. it, it wasn't serious. It wasn't, Yo, please don't let this dude die and let me get a murder beef. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It, it was just whenever I needed his help, he would help me, and I, I would forget five minutes later. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wasn't really into it like that. Cool. I, only when I wanted like money on my books, I would go to church. Yeah. Or when I was facing some That's trouble. That's cool, because me and you both have the kind of same story, and you're real about this faith <laughs> stuff too. You, you even got a you even got a uh, God security guard with you here today now too. <laughs> well, you know he's he's been one of my number one supporters, man. And, and That's awesome. Uh, you know. Uh, he never smiles though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I I ended up getting out after all that stuff, and. Um, I was like, okay, so this time I'm really gonna change my life. Okay. And I was like, what do people do that wanna change their life? They go to college. And I was like, I'm gonna sign up for college. Okay. So I get to the Phoenix College and uh, the lady calls me up and she's like, so I was like, hey lady, so I just got out of prison and I need to become a better person, so I'm looking for some college courses. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, you should take this class right here. And I was like, I was reading, and I was like, criminal justice, I was like, who takes that class? And she's like, well, people that want to be cops, social workers, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I don't think I want to sit next to a cop right now. Yeah, It's like too fresh. For sure. And she's like, no, you'll, you'll, you'll really like this class. And for some reason, I felt like this motherly love when she was talking to me. So I said, okay, sign me up. I'll, I'll do it. And um, so I, I show up an hour early to the class because as a kid, I didn't know how to read and write. So that when they would pick me, I would panic and I would become the, the class clown. So I get in trouble mm -hmm. and they would send me to the office. <clears throat> it's just because I didn't know how to read. Yeah. And th th I mean, think about how hard you've had like the, what you've had to overcome man like not only all the shit in the cartel but like literally not school not knowing how to freaking read and write bro and like i didn't know you were in prison that recent i thought you'd been out for a long time you're it's i'm just trying to wrap my head around it too. It's, it's crazy to me bro because you're like <laughs> yeah, what well, you're doing now and where you are is it's insane you know what i'm saying i know you say i'm doing good but like man to go through all that and be where you are in that time is like i can't even wrap my mind around it right now uh it's it's uh it's all god man for and, sure you know um that's why he got you out of mexico <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I got to the class and I, I met John. John Humphrey is my the guy that disciples me. He's, uh, he's How long ago did you and John meet? As soon as I got out. I got okay. out in 2017, and that's when I met him in class. He was my, oh, my professor. Five years ago? Yeah. Damn. I've only been out for five years. Wow. Um, and I met him, and I just, I would, I got I need there. to set my game up, bro. <laughs> Shit, I've been out seven years. You know, I, I got there, and I really wanted to scare him. I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to scare him so he wouldn't pick me in class. Because there was, like, pretty girls in the classroom. Yeah. And I just didn't want to look, like, weird. Yeah. So I just wanted to be the tough guy, you know? So I get there, and I'm like, hey, I'm here to learn, but just don't pick me. I'm going to sit in front, but don't pick me. 
And John don't scare that. that you told easy. him that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to punk the teacher. I didn't know he had. I didn't know he had his church teacher. I didn't know he had been a cop for 30 years. <laughs> so that came to my surprise surprisement later. You know. That is such a just a comic move. I go up to the teacher like, yo, don't fucking call on me. I didn't say it like that. I know, but I'm, you know, I try to say it as nice as I could. I said it pretty nice, right, John? <laughs> pretty please, don't fucking call on me. <laughs> but um. I watch them, man. I'm a people watcher. After doing 17 years in, in prison, bro, like I, I watch people to see yeah. if they really, if their if their actions are really what their mouth says. Yeah. So I just watch them and watch them, and, and I did my my class. I graduated. He gave me a book of devotions, and uh, he was like, "Congratulations. Uh, do you mind if we exchange numbers?" And we we became friends, and he would always, you know, call and check up on me. I was still living through a lot of chaos. Um, I was sleeping around. Um, I, I was uh, I, w I was staying sober, but I was I was a dry drunk. You know yeah. how they say in AA. Yep. <laughs> I was a dry drunk. I was living in complete sin. Yeah. And uh, you know, John, I would call John once in a while. He'd be like, "Well, you know, <laughs> you know, you live in sin. You know, think bad things are gonna happen." Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and uh, I ended up meeting my wife. My wife now. Uh, she came into Tangible Fitness. I want to say about three years, three years ago. And so I have John now, I have my wife. Uh, we were just friends. We were talking for about six months. And one night uh, I decided that I was going to kill myself because I, I couldn't believe that this was, this was it, this was life. Just going to work every day, coming home to a empty apartment and just like, I, I lived. Tell me, cause I, real quick, cause that's like one of the, I don't really have it anymore, but at first that's one of the biggest struggles. You know, like when you're in prison, you're like sh shot caller and you got it made. It's like, well, you, it you, sucks, but it ain't that bad. And you come out here and you're like, you're like you're a nothing and nothing's yeah. going on. Yeah. And that's what, and that's how I felt. I felt like I was somebody in there and I was a nobody out here. Absolutely. Even though I had been a somebody out here. That's how I felt too, for sure. But, you know, um, I, mi I missed the camaraderie in there. I, I missed my friends. I, I missed the structure. So it sucks, but I mean, you get a handful. There's some loyal ass dudes in there, bro. That you yeah, know what I'm saying? Yeah. That are like, and you and you, you spend 24 hours with you them, cry you get with so them, close. Every, yeah, everything. For sure. and, Risk and cases with them, you know what I mean? It, it's just you come out here, and there's there's you meet a lot of just crappy people, you know, that take advantage of you or use something that you say to their advantage, and, and it's just it's, it gets harder and harder. Um, so I, I met my wife. I, like I said, I was going to commit suicide that day. Um, I knew that I didn't want to go back to prison, so I figured I'll do a hot shot, get it over that's with. That's exactly what I was going to do. Boom, yeah. that's it. And so I called my wife for some reason, and she just stayed on the phone with me all night telling me how much God loved me. Did you tell her you uh, want to kill yourself? Yeah, okay. yeah, I was keeping it real with her because she was like, at the time, she was like my only really close friend. So I, I was like... I'm going to end it. And she was like, no, don't do it, JC. Like so many people, you might not think, but you're impacting so many people. And I was like, nah, you know, I'm just done. I'm tired. And she kept me on the phone, dude. For some reason, I listened. The next day she came in and she gave me a hug that I wanted to punch her in the chest because like I felt so vulnerable. I felt so broken, you know. And It's hard feeling like that too when you're like a, a gangster, you know what I'm saying, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah because you've sure. been you've been – masking those feelings forever hey, you've been wearing a mask your yeah, whole life for sure and when that mask comes off man oh man it, it's you feel everything and um we finally started dating and i moved in with her and i didn't realize how damaged i was dude until like covid hit and we were inside the house all the time and um i had a lot of schizophrenia uh bipolar uh, uh personality uh disorder uh it was just non-stop i mean i i would wake up at night and i would be choking her i'd be running around the house checking the house with the perimeter like seeing if anybody was breaking in um it, it was non-stop like i would sleep maybe two hours if i got lucky that was it mm -hmm. and it was starting to affect her a lot it was starting to affect her a lot so she she's in the bathroom praying john's praying for me and i felt that all these people praying for me, I felt like I was getting attacked more because like I was going crazy. I was losing my mind. I was seeing faces in my dreams. I was hearing voices. I was thinking that my, my wife was up to something, like cheating. And it was just, 
it was crazy. And one day, uh, I just felt so, so just broken down, so tired, so just everything. And I, I went downstairs and I, I just fell to my knees and I was like, man, dude, you, you, you got my attention. Like, like, what do you want me to do? Like, what? And man, like I always tell people, I can't describe the feeling because you have to, you gotta experience it yourself. But it was something so that lifted from me so, like I cried. I had never cried like that before. And I got up and I was like, man, that's a pretty good pre-workout right there. <laughs> like I was like, now I can go work out. And as soon as I walked into the, to the gym, it hit me again. And I fell back to my knees again. And I was like, and I just felt it in my heart because my YouTube was actually doing really well. My YouTube, was, I, I think we already, you, we were friends already and we were mm -hmm. talking, but uh, my YouTube was making like seven grand a month talking about cartels and gangs and all that stuff. So I, I'm in the garage and in my heart I feel he tells me no more talking about, you're going to talk about me now. And I'm like, man, are you sure? Because like I just started making money. Like, yeah. <laughs> what's going on? And now, nah, man, from that day on, man, I completely turned my whole life over to him, man. Uh, my faith, everything, everything. Now, I don't listen to music. Uh, I don't watch certain things. Um, I went from one side to another, pretty much. I, I stopped swearing. Like completely, tell him like everything you changed because I want people to show like it's it's literally impossible to change from the lowest of the lows, the most gangster murderer, <laughs> whatever, to what you are now is insane, bro. Yeah, like, tell bro. him like what you you're know, doing it, now. Yeah. You know, I went I went to Chicago last month and a lot of my buddies were, couldn't even believe it. They were like, "Dude, you don't even swear no more." And I'm like, "No, there's a lot of things I don't do no more." But it's because Jesus, you know, did something in my life and. My biggest thing is now to just tell people about him and what he's done in my life. It's not even about me. It's not even about my story. It's about him and how he's put my life back together. Like, no, now I just got married uh, two weeks ago. Is it two weeks ago? Yeah. Two Congrats weeks ago. On that. Uh, I went on my honeymoon and I have to give a big, like, shout out to Jeff uh, Humphrey, man, because, like, he's been my, my spiritual father. He's guided me all through this process and he stayed right there with me the whole time even when i had questions that you know brought up like my gangster in me when i'm like oh yeah, yeah. you've been racist <laughs> like, for sure you know all, all these things but like he stood his ground with me man and i got a lot of love and respect for that dude man and you know he's helped me put put the put the you know it's all god doing all the work but he helped me guide me through all the steps that i needed to learn and, and study i walk around with my bi my bible now every everywhere I go because it's like it's like my gun now you know that's what I mean? right it's, so oh, that's a go it's it's just my whole life has changed so much that you couldn't even pay me two million dollars to go back to that life and tell me you'll have 10 times more because I, I know what it was to have a million dollars in the closet I know what it was to be in nightclubs in Mexico and pull up in helicopters and, and all that stuff you know um I've had a pretty interesting life but I wouldn't change none of that for Jesus man because he's put peace in my heart he's put joy in my heart i mean I, I i my face hurts from smiling so much now and i didn't even know what what that was at one time in my life and mm. to have that now and experience that now with with my wife because even my relationship with my wife is i'm not saying that all your problems go away i'm just saying that you learn to deal with them in a in a cool collective matter <laughs> like, sure. yeah. it's not chaos yeah and you pray about everything before you make any decision and that's you know you give him all the all the glory man because without him i'm i'm just old jc the old sinner you know he's the one that that put this guy back together and is and my life keeps keeps evolving and changing man and in september um uh locked up abroad that show on the national geographic channel yeah. is gonna air my story <clears throat> and um I've been on a couple of shows. I say you've been on about five different TV shows. Yeah, I've been, like on, I've been yeah. on a couple of TV shows, but they just want to use the whole gangster image on the shows. On this show, it's going to be the first time they actually show my whole transformation, everything from, you know, where I was in Mexico to the redemption part. And, and that's what we need nowadays, man, because <clears> these kids <throat> need to see that even if you did make mistakes or you have been on that bad road, you, there is hope and change out there, you know, and, yeah. and it's through him. Yeah. Through him, and he's he could put any if he put me together, he could put anybody together because 
like I said, a lot of people don't know how really damaged I was because they don't, man. Only, only you know what you've been through. And uh, uh, that's my message, man, is, is, is seek the Lord, you know, walk with Jesus. And, and I, I, I'm a pit bull about it, man. I, I walk around with my Bible. I preach it. I walk it. I'm, uh, John calls me Peter because, like, sometimes I get, I get mad about it because I'm like, man, I'm trying to give you for free what was given for me, to me. Like, it changed my life. So I want, I want to show you. Yeah. It's, you don't have to live in chaos. You don't have to live like this. There is peace out there. Damn, yeah, bro. Yeah. What an insane story you have, man. I'm, I, I, don't, I literally can't even think right now. I'm, I'm, and I don't ever get speechless too often, dude, but I'm speechless. And I remember so, and I think I, you reached out to me in the middle of like the kind of struggles too, because remember we went to that meeting for the yeah. first time. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I got wrong and strong down old and Awatuki and went and you met with my sponsor yeah. and stuff. And what a cool that was, moment that was. That was right, right before my walk. So I was still like, I was trying to figure out. Like, yeah. So that day I was... I was like, man, I know I don't want to get high. I don't want to drink. So I'm going to I think you texted me like 4 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. You're like, yo, dude, yeah. you going to a meeting? I was like, yeah, I, was I go at 6 30 this morning. I was, yeah. was at the bottom of the bottom already. And I, I, I just, I knew it was, I just, I didn't realize it was him pulling on my heart. <clears throat> yeah. You know, and, and once everything came together, he hit me. I mean, it's only been eight months. A lot of people will be like, JC, how long have you been saved? And I'll be like, eight months, November. They're like, oh. I thought you'd been safe for way longer yeah, than that. Seriously, I, you act. I thought you'd been out of prison ten years plus, and you've been with this for five years. You know? No, nah, man. I'm a I'm a straight soldier, man. But that Everything shows. I and do. I want to I want to get into that. Like, no matter what you do and all the shit you've been through, like it's we're all people, bro. So like, you're sitting at home thinking, I don't know what the what the hell to do. What's my next move? Probably saw me, knew I'm doing meetings or something like that. You're like, shit, I might as well go try. Mm -hmm. So, and that's literally how it happens. You shoot me, and I'm not taking zero responsibility for credit for this, but you shoot me a text, I go to a meeting, we go together, and it's like everybody in their home that's struggling and thinking this shit, like, we all go through the same shit. If you're thinking about it and like scared what to do, make the fucking change, you know, like make the fucking call, send the text message to get you well, that's the going in thing. the right direction. That's the biggest thing is to tell people. Just, just, just call somebody. Yeah, Text make somebody. a fucking phone call. That's why it's so important. Like I tell guys that are new to the faith, I tell guys you need to be discipled. You need to find a good church. You need to surround yourself with people that are doing the same <clears throat> walk as you. Because if not, it's really easy to go back yeah. to the old stuff. It's really, really easy. But I'm a straight soldier, man. I get up at two forty-five in the morning every day. I study by three. I study for about four hours before I work out. I'm going to school because I'm gonna be a pastor one day. Wow, and, what a uh, fucking unbelievable story! <laughs> like uh, this is the first podcast. I don't even know what to say. Like I'm serious, bro. Like you're fucking like I'm speechless right now, bro. Like uh, it's you got me teary eyed right bro. now. And because I know even more than this too, it's like I don't even know how much I should say about this or whatever. I'm not too worried about my life. Like God's gonna take me out whenever I, it's time for me to go. And but just to show how much of transformation people can make in this man right here. Like when I got that picture of. I got a random picture of you with my boy who was the top dude for the Aryan Brotherhood and the whole AZ and you guys are together at church with this guy and I was just like, dude, I swear to God, man, when I got that picture, I like, it's makes me want to like cry again. I was just like, you're fucking kidding me. Like, how are these two? And then you two are together and then you sent it to me. It's like, I didn't even know you knew we knew each other. You know what I'm saying? And I was just like, oh my God. And I literally thought right then, I was like, holy shit, if I'm not going to put his name in here, but if him and you can be on there, like literally anybody can change. And like well, God can absolutely do anything he wants to, man. If you well, that's him. why you have to look at it like that, bro, is that God put you in, in our lives for a reason. We all are in this for a reason. We just have to seek him and, you know, uh, do what, it, what we're supposed to do, you know. And, and I don't think it's a coincidence that I met you. I don't, yeah, I don't no, think man. it's a coincidence that I met him. I, I don't think it's a coincidence that I met John. Um, he has a plan and... Right now, we, we live in really bad times where, you know, uh, people don't realize how bad it is because of social media, because of everything. You know, our kids are growing up way too fast. Mm -hmm. They're growing up here, but they're not growing up here. Yeah, that's right. You know, and that's the thing is that it's going to take a generation like us to kind of um, set the, 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 the bar to actually teach these kids that there is something better out there. there. You don't have to fulfill all that pain or 
loneliness with drugs and sex and just worthless stuff, even yeah, video games. For sure. Because anything that makes you sit down for hours and you waste your whole day there Literally. is bad. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, you know, uh, TV's it, the same, bro. I don't even turn my yeah, TV on until yeah. 9 o'clock at night. Dude, if, if I show you my schedule, like every hour, every minute counts, even here right now. I, 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 everything's locked in. And I was talking about on the golf course today with my buddy, too, is like, because once you've lost everything and you don't have a chance to go hustle or to do anything like that, and you actually have 24 hours in a day to do whatever the hell you want, like, you appreciate that more, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Well. And it makes you think, like, I can't actually do this, so I'm going to actually die trying, and I'm not just going to be stagnant like the rest of the people that have never lost their freedom. So I feel like, and that's why I always tell all of, everybody in the world, all of us have an advantage on the rest of the world just because we've had our backs against the wall. Once we can turn that and we see what's possible, like, we literally have one leg up on the rest of the regular citizens that never did anything bad. Think about it. How much energy we consume trying to get <clears throat> what we want it. If you just take all that energy and just focus into something else, it was just like, you know, building my YouTube channel. Yeah. I never thought I was going to have that many subscribers. For sure. But I did it every day. Don't you have a, a, a you got a, a nonprofit or something like that? that we, we're, I want to give a shout out to that too, because I have a bunch of followers that have big pockets and are just good, good, awesome people, man. So if I ask for one thing, it's to help this man out yeah. right here with this. And I want you to shout out whatever you need help with. Well, yeah. it's, 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 uh, it's in the building blocks right now. We're actually just opening up the uh, bank account. It's uh, Wrong to Strong Ministries. And uh, what we're going to be doing is I'm going to be traveling to every state, uh, the bad, I call it the, the level four yards, the bad areas. Uh, I'm going to try and get into the level four yards too. Um, I'm going to go to a lot of places where I guess you could say normal people really can't go yeah. or they're afraid to go. For I mean, sure. I'm just going to keep it real. 100%. There's, <clears throat> there's a lot of rules that they wouldn't be able to follow in there. And you could say the wrong thing and something could happen. So uh, that's, that's my main thing. And, and I, I believe that God built everybody for a specific purpose. And, and uh, I, never, I didn't ever knew what my purpose was until today that I walk with Jesus, man. And now I know what I need to do. <clears throat> I get a little sentimental. <laughs> Let's get it. Look at this killer right here crying on here. I love it. I love uh, it. Man, bro, there's just there's so many broken guys out there. Yeah. Men. There's a lot of broken men out there. And I know there's a lot of broken women too, but you know, men tend to try to hide it and play the tough role. And enough is enough, man. Like yeah. a real man is somebody that could say, Hey, I'm broken, I need help. Please help me. And that's that's the first step to, f to finding, you know, God and, and walking with Jesus, man. Damn. How was, uh, how was he talking to him there? Like, uh, I know his, his, I know him from the joint, but like I was on the yard with him and uh, I know he keeps everything, his whole prison life a secret and he's just completely washed his hands with that. But it's like, it's almost, I just want to know like how your conversation went because it's, it's like the person I know is unbelievable. When I talk to him on the phone here and I see him, I'm just like, it's the same as you, bro. Like I can't fathom like, I feel like I made a cool transformation. It is what it is, but like your guys is like insane, especially him for what he did. You know what I mean? Well, we ha we have we have a lot of things in common, yeah. uh, a lot of pain, a lot of uh, stuff. But the main thing is that we both love Jesus, and 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 uh, we're just trying to trying to spread. People the word. don't know That's how much it. of a miracle it is that this guy was in in <laughs> church too. Like John I'm not knows. joking. <laughs> like knows. he was he was anti everything. Like. You couldn't have a more badass reputation. Well, no God, no nothing. So I'm serious. When I saw that, I was just like, you are freaking kidding me. That's what uh, God uses. And, and God uses people. I mean, come on. He used 12 guys to transform the whole world, bro. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, uh, I, I'm in love with my walk. Like I said, there's nothing you could say. or And I tell all my guys in Chicago, because I, I have a couple guys that I'm discipling right now. So the main purpose that Wrong to Strong Ministries is going to be doing is going to have a relocation program where I'm going to bring the gang members from other parts of the country, the world, to here to Arizona, uh, disciple them for about a year, and then send them back out to catch fish for more men. There you go. And bring them back. Full body armor and but, shit. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, training them and actually showing them the right way. Uh, everything, you know, scripture, fitness, diet, everything, because a soldier needs to be in complete, just ready to go to war. And, and that's one thing that uh, I think that I've learned throughout my whole life and, and the way that I lived, and now God is just using it for his glory. That's it. How fulfilling is life now for you? Like, oh, man. I, you know, like I, like I, sh I showed you that, that house I was going to buy a couple months yeah. back, and, and now... Bigger than that Mexico prison, probably. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was all about money. It was all about, like, me being famous and becoming an actor and all this. And now... Everything's changed, man. Me now, I just I just want to help save some souls, man. I just 
I want to give to these guys uh, the hope and, and the, what I have in my heart now. Like, it's just priceless, man. I never, I never thought, even just getting over, because my childhood, me being raped, drowned, I mean, that alone, that alone. Is... Yeah, people, a lot of guys, they can't even literally grasp this. Because I remember, you know what's crazy? When we started talking, I remember I was actually going to the water park one day. Remember, and I was like, Ashton, I knew we, had, we were trying to get together. And I was like, yo, you want to come to the water park? Yeah. We're going there right by your house. And this fool literally is like, oh, I don't do water. I was like, what do you mean you don't do water? He's like, oh, I got drowned by the cartel when I was like 14 years old. So he's like, I have PTSD from water. And I was just I like, just, Jesus I don't, Christ, I don't man. do water, bro. Uh, when I was a kid, that was one water, of the... don't do water, bro. <laughs> yeah. That was one of the forms of That's torture. <laughs> 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 I just don't do water, you know? And, and uh, when I got baptized, um, the pastor freaked out a little bit. And he's like, you should have told me, dude. And I was like, no, I had to... I had to fulfill that, man, because when that dude would drown me, he would drown me, and I would, like, pass out. And then he would take me out, resuscitate me, and then do it all over again. So he did a number on me with the water thing. So when I got baptized, the pastor took me in. I, out, I, I panicked because yeah. while I was in the water, all I seen was I seen the guy. I seen his hand. But then when the pastor pulled me out, I seen light and, like, I just felt like that was lifted from me. And it's gone, huh? Man, uh, he's, I mean, I, I love Jesus, man. And if anybody says Look at him different. smiling <laughs> saying that, bro. If that ain't some authentic I, shit, I don't I, know what it is. I love Jesus, and whatever he wants me to do, his, his will, man, I, I'm ready, man. I'm ready to go. I lift my hand because I'm, I'll go to any war for That's him. That's right. That's right. And I, I love him, man. Any bit of. Just give some last bit of advice for dudes that are locked up listening to this or guys that are freshly getting out or something like that. Just how to like start getting on the right track or doing what you're doing. Because my biggest trouble, and, and I want some advice on this for myself, because I still have a hard time sometimes. Well, I, I clearly believe in God now and have faith and all that stuff. But it's like when you're like people say like pray to God and to answer his questions. I'm like, I don't see the answers. I don't like I don't get it. So I still have trouble with that. So like how do people find that stuff? You know, and how did you find it and start like I'm being and seriously, do, is it like a voice you hear that's like, yo, do this? Or is it just like, you know, it's just your conscience now telling you to do that or what? You know, and I, cause I struggle this, with this myself. Do you want me to be honest? Please. One man, you got to really, really give your comp everything to him and really have faith and know that he's going to, it's, it's not, you know, praying has a lot to do with it. There's a big part of it, but the number one thing is having complete faith in him and giving them everything, bro, where like, your swearing has to stop. The way that you talk or treat people has to stop. A lot of things have to change because it's true. You become completely different to everybody, to everybody. But little by little, the sanctification part starts and he starts pulling all that stuff away from you and you don't even notice it no more. You start to do it just kind of, you're just, you're a child of God. That's it. That you, you're smiling, you're walking different. And that's the number one thing that everybody like seen in me when I went to Chicago because I was I was a ruthless dude on the street. Dude, I'm right around starting the park and he gets out of his car with the biggest smile on his face, he's holding his Bible. <laughs> and now, you know, they see me walking around with this Bible and I'm like, you know, I, I just, I know what he did for me in my life. So that's why I always tell people, if you really want to change, you need to seek God, you need to find Jesus, you need to walk the walk, talk the talk, train, get disciple, find a church. It's just like everything else in life. Like it's this is the manual of life right here. Any answer, any question you have is in here. It's in here. And it's it's been around for so long. So, you know, my biggest question to John was like, man, I should have picked this up 20 years ago. And John's like, yeah, but it wasn't your time. You, you had to ready. have this story to you help so many other people, bro. Yeah. So like, you know, that that's my biggest <clears throat> my biggest thing to people is seek seek God, you know, and find a church. And once you do that, it's it gives your whole purpose, your whole life purpose. Because clearly, I don't even have to ask you. And I know you feel the same way. Like I never understood why I got so much freaking prison time for a burglary charge, you know, and it didn't make any sense to me. And the whole time I was in prison, I thought. There's no chance God's real because if he is, why the hell would he give me 12 years for a burglary charge? Like what? That's because he, he knew that was the amount of time it was going to take you yeah. to sit down. That's why, that, <laughs> for sure. No, absolutely. And But then when you finally get faith and believe in God, your whole life makes sense. Yeah, you know man. what I'm saying? Then I thought like, I was like, 
That's why he gave me 12 years. And people you know? need to realize, bro, that like, you know, they, they see religion as, oh man, you know, it's a bunch of rules. I, I, I don't, I don't, it's not rules, man. I, actually, yeah. all this stuff is, is set to protect you. Mm -hmm. If you're running around having sex with multiple women and all that stuff, guess where STDs come from? From that. Like all these rules are placed to protect you. Mm -hmm. It's not that he wants to be a controlling father or he wants to have a relationship with you. I get up in the morning and when I sit down in complete darkness in my living room, it's just sit down and talk to him. There's not one day that I don't cry, man, because I have so much to tell him and so much to be thankful for that it's just every day <clears throat> I can't wait to get up and do it all over again. God, dude, I say that. It's like our lives, I went from at night, I was like, I would try to stay up as long as possible so I could sleep in a little bit longer because I didn't want to wake up for the next day. And when you change your life and you got it going like we do, now it's like, I want to go to sleep early so I can wake up because yeah. I can't wait for tomorrow. Yeah, I'm in it's bed like by now seven. for the first time in my life, I'm like, I can't wait to see what good stuff happens in my life yeah. now tomorrow rather than just being scared of the next fucking day. Yeah. You know what I mean? Every time, every time I drive, bro, I, I cry. I cry every time I drive because I spent so much time in transit with chains and shackles. In the back with me. no windows and you shit. Know, like sitting this, on plastic seats. The yeah. whole time. And I drive now. And today I drive and I start crying and it's because I know where I'm going. You know, I know where I'm going now. And a lot of people have, have it twisted where they think, oh, I've done too much or, or I've seen too much or I, I've sinned too much. And I'm like, nah, you know, Jesus died on the cross for a reason. Just let him do what he came to do. <clears throat> that's right. And that's salvation. Yeah. So like, just get out the way, dude, and, and let him do his job. That's right. You know? Do you mind if, I don't know how busy this man John is, but do you mind, can we give him a shout out or if anybody's listening, if they want to go or even to the church a shout out or something like that? Yeah. I'm serious. Like it's, it's a, it, I've said it four times, hey, already, but it's he, an absolute he miracle. He loves to help people. His call to God is discipling people. So I always say it on my YouTube channel too. Like if you guys have any questions for John, John is like more than willing to like answer questions, <clears throat> get on the phone with you. That's what, what he church feels. is he at? Can we can we say that on it's here? It's at Desert View Bible Church. Desert View Bible Church. It's on Carefree Highway, okay. 105 West Carefree Highway. I know the address by heart. <laughs> there we go. And then you're on Instagram, wrong too strong. Wrong too strong. Unfreaking believable, man. Uh, dude, I, this is way better than I anticipated. I, like I said, I knew of only bits and pieces of your story. Yeah, so I don't I'm share too crazy. Much. <laughs> I'll be driving home like this thing. Holy shit! I got new gratitude in my life. So that's what I needed too. So this is going to help a ton, a ton of people, man. And like I said, I'm. I mean this from the bottom of my heart, bro. I, I absolutely love you, and I'm you, I love you. like just grateful to know you as a person. Um, and just excited for you in the future, and like I said, I just can't say enough. And thank you so much for coming and doing this, bro. I love you. I, I feel blessed for being here, man. I love you, man. All right, and then to all my audience, I love you guys too. <laughs> thank <laughs> you guys you again all. for tuning in to another episode of Roll Call with Chappie. This shit is fire. I love you guys, man. Go make a change. Make a call. Send the text. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe wherever you get your podcast and leave us some feedback. We would love to know what you think. You can find everything discussed in this episode and more in our show notes below or petermeyeroff.com. I am Peter Meyeroff, and you've been listening to the Roll Call with Chappie podcast.